Thank you, Hannah, Tiffany, and Mark for awesome worship here. And I think of that last song. It just hit me, hitting it of one of the lyrics of, uh, of that song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And that is drawn directly out of Scripture in Revelation chapter 4 when all the creatures are worshiping his name. Holy, holy, holy is our Lord God Almighty. What an awesome, awesome uh, song for our praise to think about and to listen to here this morning. So yes, good morning once again, and this is part three now of our Law versus Grace study. In the past two Sundays, we've really explored grace versus law. And uh, in both the passages that we looked at last week and the week before that, the word grace was mentioned in both of our texts here today. Uh, I'm sorry, back then, both of, the, both of our texts had that word grace in it. And today, we only have one verse to look at. One very powerful verse where we see the word law actually mentioned three different times in our text here. And we never actually see the word grace. But as you will see, and as I mentioned last week, grace is a virtue given to us by our faith. And faith is going to be a very key central idea of our text. And as my message will be here this morning. So I think if we can know that truth, we can draw the conclusion that, well, faith is going to be a part of our text here, then grace will be as well, even if we don't see that word at all here today. Uh, But before we get started here, I want us to dissect a phrase. And if you saw the back of the bulletin here today, you've already seen the phrase, and it's the, the title of my sermon here today. It's not rocket science. When do we say this? Maybe when we're explaining how to do something to someone that maybe we think is very easy, but we watch someone else struggling to do it. Or maybe when we're watching someone fail at some of the most simple tasks, we may say it. And for me, if I'm driving uh, and I want to make a left turn uh, shortly, sometimes I'll, most of the time, I will stay in the right lane as far as possible until the very last minute before I move over to get in the left lane. And sometimes I'll even miss my turn because I will do that. Uh, I'll miss too, uh, I'll I'll take too long for me to turn over to the left lane. And sometimes my wife will say, Troy, move over sooner. Just get in the left lane. It's right there. It's not rocket science. Or sometimes my wife will leave coffee mugs in the living room all day long while coffee is still in the mugs. And I'll say, Tiffany, you walk by the sink every time you get up. Just pick up the mug, pour the coffee down the drain, and leave the cup in the sink. It's not rocket science. And our passage here today is not rocket science. Our passage today has a ton of history behind it, a ton of church history behind it. Our passage today helped spark the greatest reformation in church history 507 short years ago. Because we see back in the 1500s, there was a certain Roman Catholic monk, priest and turned monk, uh, who lived in Germany by the name of Martin Luther. Martin Luther read two passages of scripture in his own personal study that really flipped the whole world upside down. It It flipped his world upside down. And would very soon flip the entire world upside down. And he read, as I mentioned, two passages of scripture that helped us help him do that. And the first one was the Romans 1 passage that we read in our scripture reading here today. The just shall live by faith. Or the righteous shall live by faith. And the second passage he read is found in Galatians 2, which I'm about to read here today. And after reading both passages of scripture, he told his fellow priests, he said, friends. I think we have our theology wrong. I don't think people become justified. I don't think people become right with God by their good works. I don't think people become justified by that or being or giving money to the church or following the Jewish Mosaic law. But instead, I think people get to heaven by faith in Jesus Christ. And what he accomplished on the cross. Right? This isn't rocket science, I bet he was saying. Look at what the Bible, see what the scripture tells us. 
And they said, oh, Martin, you better shut up about your weird beliefs. It goes against the traditions of the church. And if you don't shut up about this, we might have to disassociate ourselves with you. And Martin said, so be it then, because the just will live by faith. I have this quote here on our screen here. Faith is living. It's daring. It's confidence in God's grace. So we see in Martin Luther's quote there, grace and faith, they're inwardly connected for us to see. Faith is living out what we know to be true, what we know what scripture says about the grace that is lavished on us when we put our faith in him. And when I read this Galatians 2 passage, of course I want us to think about what Paul is trying to communicate to us. But I also want us to think about all the people in the past 100, 507 years who have maybe been disowned by their parents, who have been excommunicated from their church, who have even given up their entire lives because they believe the radical words I'm about to put on the screen for us. And I want you to also think how these words that I'm going to put on the screen, they're really not rocket science. They mean exactly what they say. So turn with me now to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, just one verse, just verse 16. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians Chapter 2, verse 16, the radical words, he says, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Well, a verse that starts with the word yet means we, I think, have to do some context giving right here. We have to look back at what the previous verse said, and let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Well, the previous verse in, in chapter 2, verse 15, says we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And a few of you last Sunday came up to me after church and said that you loved my little illustration there and the quote that I gave from the, uh, the first century of what first century Jews thought about Gentiles. And if you recall from my, my sermon last week, I said that a big quote that the Jews were saying at this time was, the only reason God made Gentiles is to fuel the fire of hell. Remember that quote? And it's like, whoa, I, does that, did they really say that? Yes, they did say that. And last week, looking at Paul's testimony, we saw that God made him the apostle to bring forth the gospel of the Gentile world. Right? Even though before he accepted Christ, he himself hated Gentiles. And Paul was preaching this message of grace and how Gentiles are co-heirs in Christ. As God is working with Jews and Gentiles alike as one body, as members of the body of Christ. And we can see that here. And we meet someone. Well, Paul met someone on the journey, someone that we know, if we read the Gospels very well, a very close companion of, of, of Jesus is Peter himself. And later in Paul's ministry, he got to meet Peter and do ministry with Peter. And Peter, at first, appeared to have such a welcoming spirit to him when welcoming Gentiles into the church. That was at first. But recently, once Peter arrived in Antioch, where they were doing ministry, he quickly refused to associate himself with fellow Christians. These are Gentile Christians, fellow Christians, but he refused to associate himself with them because they were Gentiles. They were not Jews. They were not, they were, again, pagans, right? They were, they were people, formerly pagans. They were people who did not have the blessings from this line uh, of Jacob, from the, the Jewish line. And really the second half of Galatians chapter two is Paul explaining of how Peter was in the wrong. Peter was in the wrong of what he was doing and how he was treating these people, but also he was in the wrong because of his mindset and what he was believing that was causing him to live like this. And Paul says in, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, this is all context that sets us up for Galatians 2, 16, the verse that we read, the context here in, in chapter 2, verse 11, he says, but when Cephas, which is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him 
to his face. Okay, to his face he opposed. He wasn't talking behind his back. He was blunt of, you are in the wrong here. He had no problem. Paul had no problem saying that to his face. And yes, I think by now, I think we have an idea of why Paul opposed Peter during this. Because Peter wasn't living out the basic truths and what and how God was working and how God was working with all people in terms of salvation. Because those living under the law, those living by the flesh, are sinners. Sinners who need grace. Sinners who don't need more law. Sinners who need more grace. They need redemption. So Peter shouldn't be feeding sinners more law. He should be feeding them more grace. And I think of Paul's words in Romans. In Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 9 and 10, he says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. Okay? All Jews are sinful. All Gentiles are sinful. No one is righteous. Not even us Jews. And back to our Galatians passage now, and I, I think even if we want to do one more verse to look at, in chapter 2, verse 14, uh, right before this, Paul, again, to set, see, set the scene and to set the context, Paul says, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? This is Paul still calling out Peter. How could you do that? How could you force Gentile people who have nothing to do with our law to live by the law? Why would you feed them more law again when they need grace? So yes, we can, we can set the scene. Paul is saying here, look, you, you, Peter, a Jewish man, you know very well that even you are not under the law. You are now under grace. So why are you making Gentiles live under the law? Gentiles who are under grace, why are you making them under the law too? And now going into, uh, into verse 15, uh, again, Paul is, is now basically saying, look, Peter, you need to wrap your head around this. You and I, we had the same upbringing. We both grew up as observant Jews. We both had an understanding of God and the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets better than anyone. Therefore, we know better than anyone that we were never considered right. We were never considered just before God. By following the Ten Commandments, by following the Mosaic Law, it's always been by faith. We may have lived out the law. We may have lived out following the rules and the traditions and the feast days and all these things. But you and I both know those things never saved us. Even before we met our friend Jesus, the law never saved us. But instead, we both know that it was our faith that saved us back then. And it's still our faith that saves us now. Nothing has changed, Peter. So yes, we grew up observing the Torah, those feast days. But those things never changed us or saved us. We are considered right. We are considered just before God. By now our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And after that, I can't help but to think, Paul said, this isn't rocket science. This is easy stuff. Let's grasp it. And with this doctrine right here, justification by faith, so important. And even we think of today here in this age of grace, guess what? All members in this present dispensation, black or white, Asian or Hispanic, Jews or Gentiles, were considered right before God because of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that itself is grace. That idea right there that all people can become justified by God through faith, that is grace. That is what grace is all about. So yes, back to justification by faith. This is a theological truth that's so important that for almost 1,500 years, this truth seemed lost in the church. Clearly, we saw it was there in Scripture. Clearly, we saw this was what Paul was trying to say. But in church history, 
Very few were talking about this. And next to no one was preaching this. And hardly anyone was believing this. But as we saw, Paul preached it. Paul believed it. Because Paul knew that God has justified any and every believer, not by the works, not by the law, but, but Paul knew that he justifies believers by faith. Because he himself was never justified by works. He himself was always justified by faith. And our text here makes that clear as possible. Clear as possible. And I want us to take a, a moment here to really dive into what this word justify means. So we only see that word here, uh, as we do see that word here three times in our one little verse here today. So let's look at this. Well, when looking at this sermon series, I'm answering this question of grace versus law. I, I suppose we're really trying to answer the question here of what makes us justified? What makes us right before God? Is it by grace or is it by the law? And if we can answer that question, our next question then after that is how do we get justified? Because if one answer is the law, if the law is what makes us justified, then the answer is following it is how we get justified. If the law is the answer, we get justified by living it out. But if our justification is by grace, we can get that grace, we can receive that grace, then through faith. And justification here is really a legal concept. Right? Because a person who is justified is a person who gets the verdict in a court of law. Therefore, we can say now in a Christian sense that it means getting a verdict before God himself. And that verdict is that the judge, the judge being God, declares you, the defendant, righteous. You are declared righteous. So being justified is being declared righteous. Righteous by the judge, and the judge being God. Are we following this? And as we can see here now, going back to our text here that we have on the screen, that our judge, our judge God, does not declare us righteous by the law, but instead our judge, our God, declares us righteous by faith in Christ. See right there in verse 16. Well, I guess it's all verse 16. But this first part, this first line, that we know that a person is not justified by the works, but through faith. It's there for us to see. It's there for us to grasp. So yes, if we believed in Christ Jesus, if we believe the gospel, if we believe what he accomplished on the cross, we are then justified. We are then declared righteous by our faith by the judge. Is this rocket science? I don't think so. This is not rocket science. And the truth is that Paul knew that even him, even a Jew who observed the law in every way imaginable, could never receive justification before Almighty God through just the law of Moses. So if Paul believed that in faith, and if Paul didn't believe in the works of the law to save, why, why would we then? Why would we believe in the works if Paul didn't? Because we were reminded that the law was never meant to save. But instead, the law was meant to point out that we could never perfectly follow it. And since we can never perfectly follow it, that shows us that we need a Savior. That we need to be justified before God. And through faith is exactly how we do that. Not through the law, but by grace through faith. That's what makes us justified before God. And if you recall back in, not this past October, but the October, October before that, during my first year here, looking at the Reformation, we did a five-part series on the five pillars of the Reformation. And one of that, the Latin word, sola fide, Sola means alone, fide, faith. And it's faith 
alone. Such a big pillar of the Reformation. And Galatians 2.16, our text today, was the big pillar. Because again, Martin Luther was transformed by Galatians 2.16. So should we with our theology. Sola fide. Faith alone. Faith alone looks at the accomplished work of Christ. It looks at the cross and it says it is finished. It says it's done. Sola fide says, I believe by faith that Christ died for my sins. I believe that alone justifies me before God. I believe that because it acknowledges that the sacrifice and the forgiveness of sins that Christ paid for on the cross is what actually saves me. Faith alone, so important in our faith. Because the law doesn't do that. The law does the exact opposite if we're trusting in that for our salvation. Because trusting in the law to justify you or your sins means that it's not finished in your mind. You're saying, I need to work a little harder. You're saying, I need to do a little more to make God forgive me of my sins. That's not the answer. That's not the gospel. Following the law and your good works for justification is opposite of what Christ accomplished on the cross. It's the opposite of the gospel. Because by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is what saves. I talked to a pastor actually last time at the pastor's conference in Phoenix. I don't have this in my notes. I just thought of this right now. Um, I told him about our study uh, back in uh, October 2022. And I said, you know, it was important. Martin Luther, he nailed these truths on the wall. And he said, you know what, Troy? And I said, what? He said, the church needs to nail them again to the wall. Think of that. These are important things for us to grasp. It's what saves. It's what justifies any and every believer who comes by faith. So looking back to the context of what Paul was doing in addressing the second half of Galatians 2, of explaining how Peter was in the wrong, we can conclude with asking ourselves, what difference does it make if a Gentile is circumcised or uncircumcised according to the law? Because remember, they're in the Jerusalem Council. That was a big, big deal. That was a big issue that the Jewish believers were working through. Well, if a Gentile comes to faith in Christ, do we throw the law back at him? No. What difference does it make? What difference does it make if a Gentile keeps a kosher diet? What difference does it make if a Gentile does choose to eat pork or shrimp or other parts of the, the Leviticus do not? Because all that matters is faith in Christ. Because that is how we are made righteous before God. That is how God can declare us righteous and forgive us from our sins. By his grace through his faith. It's not rocket science. The law was never meant to save, nor we as members of the body of Christ are called to being a slave to it, being a slave to following it. No, but instead by grace through faith in Christ is how we guilty sinners, guilty defendants in the court of law are being able to make, being be able to be declared righteous by the ultimate judge, which is God himself. Can we believe that we only looked at one verse today? That there's all this truth in this reality that we're not justified by works of the law, but rather by faith? There's these radical world, these radical words that set the world on fire and flip the whole world upside down. It's so important. A verse, one verse that's been debated in seminaries all across the world for centuries, centuries. But to me and to Paul and hopefully to you, Galatians 2:16 isn't rocket science. Because Galatians 2:16 teaches us exactly what it says that we aren't justified by the law but instead we're justified by faith in the lord jesus christ and that itself is the gospel that itself is why christ came to die 
That is why we have the cross as the symbol of our faith, because it recognizes and acknowledges what he accomplished for us on the cross. That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again. And our faith in that message declares us righteous, right? It counts us righteous because of what he accomplished. Our faith saves us from the wrath that we all deserve because we know all of us are sinners. All of us are guilty of sin. All of us have failed God at one point in our lives. And that root of our sin is found in our nature as sinners, not just our choice to rebel against the creator. So yes, that's the bad news right there. The bad news is that every single one of us are sinners. But the good news is that Christ died for sinners. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, that therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can't have peace with God by doing more good. We can't have peace with God by following more law, more rules, more religion, more regulations. But we can have peace with God through faith. Not our checklist, but by faith. We really can do this. We really can have a relationship with our creator by faith in what Christ accomplished for us on the cross. I pray that we've trusted this message. I pray that we've trusted the free gift of salvation that God gives us freely by our faith. And I pray that faith alone understands and recognizes what Christ accomplished and our need for that. Because yes, our picture right here, the believer, when, when, by, fit, put, when by putting their faith in Christ, our guilt, our shame was credited to then Jesus on the cross because Christ bore that on the cross. That guilt, that shame, that punishment, that sin was placed upon him. And because that sin was placed upon him, then Christ's righteousness, because remember, he who knew no sin became sin, so that now we may become the righteousness of God. We now can live out Christ's righteousness. That Christ's righteousness is now given to us freely. That is what grace is all about. We can only access that grace through our faith. Because we're justified by faith, not the works of the law. It's not rocket science. Let us go to prayer. Father, we're so thankful for who you are. We think of back in 1517, 507 short years ago, how that started a movement in Europe that spread to the world. That my goodness, we don't get to heaven by our works. We don't get to heaven by giving money to the church. I think Paul told us that we get to heaven by faith. We think of how that one verse that we read today has divided families, has divided churches, has divided countries around the world since that day. But it's so clear for us to see. It's so clear for us to grasp that it has never been by works, but always been by faith. Not just since Christ died, but even before that, the Old Testament. Sure, the law was there for Israel. Sure, Israel was commanded to follow it. But as Paul pointed out to Peter, Peter, remember, even us following these traditions back in the day never saved us. But it was always by faith. Faith in God. And that faith then counted him as righteous. I think of the author in Hebrews who says, Abraham believed. Abraham became by faith and righteousness was accredited to him. Father, we sinners can be justified by faith in what you accomplish on the cross. Because the cross screams done. The cross does not scream do. Father, I just pray that we can grasp this truth, that we can live this out. This has practical meaning to our lives.
that yes, we are, as Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are his workmanship. Those are real verses. Those are true facts. But it's not what saves us. What saves us is our faith. So, Father, we praise your name, the name that gives us salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. In your holy name we pray.